Thank you for the flowers. Um, if you want to follow the slides on your uh, notebook, there is this URL, uh, tinyurl.com slash moderncd. Um, and this will kind of move you forward automatically as we move forward here. All right. Um, yeah, have you ever compared other professions uh, with software development, really? I mean, um, I'm talking about construction, plumbers, electricians, and doctors. So, you know, what I mean is, do doctors wash their hands when they do, before they do a surgery on you? Do you want that? Or would you pay extra if they do? Um, electricians, do they add a grounding phase to every installation or just the ones that are paid better? Um, plumbers, you know, when they fix a toilet, um, when, when they mount a toilet, they usually use a rubber seal on, on it for every toilet, don't they? And, uh, and then in construction, I mean, bridges, this is the, the example. Um, yeah, they, usually there is an architect that does the bridge, and uh, he hires or she hires structural engineers that do stress analysis and calculations so that that really works out and doesn't break. So imagine the Golden Gate Bridge uh, breaking down with a lot of traffic on it. I mean, it's horrible. So. so what about software development? Do we do that? So does every one of us write tests? I mean, seriously, who writes tests for every piece of code? Well, I mean, what you, you think that's fine, everything, every valuable piece of code. If you think the code is not worth anything, you probably don't need, but who, who does it? I mean, who does it really? Yeah, more than I would have guessed. And, uh, well, the modern about uh, the, the continuous delivery here in this talk. Let me just get my... Beamer on, yeah. Does this show? Yeah. So the modern is actually less modern than you would think. It's more about how would, um, yeah, how, how should you work today? So and uh, so that it's actually working out for tomorrow, and nothing bad happens like uh, bridges that break down or so. So it's. Not only about uh, Kubernetes and, and uh, hype technologies and so um, all the con technologies you'll probably notice, uh, but keep in mind that the, the actual point of this presentation, of this talk, is that you should do your software properly. Right. My name is uh, Peter Bittner. Um, I'm a developer of people, companies, and code. I run painless software, and uh, uh, for my day job, I'm a DevOps engineer uh, at Vision AG in Zurich. And I do a couple of uh, open source or free software projects, really. So there is a, a choice of them here on the slide. And yes, uh, well, I love to, to uh, help everyone run their software smoothly. And this is uh, also what is continuous delivery about. So let's go to the basics. This is the definition. It's a set of practices and principles in software engineering aimed at building, testing, and releasing software safely, faster, more frequently, and in a sustainable way. And there's more to it. It is the goal of continuous delivery to put the release schedules out of the hands of IT and into the hands of business. So the one that pays you, I mean, I'm not talking about your boss, the, the, your customer, the, the feature sponsors, they are meant to press the release button and you are meant to prepare everything for that. And there are some other uh, terms that are, well, used confusingly uh, in a similar way that I, might that I want to mention. So especially continuous deployment. So this is popular, uh, is a popular term today used by Amazon, GitLab, um, Atlassian, unfortunately in the wrong way, I believe, um, because 
continuous delivery is actually a concept, and the other two are techniques. So you use a technique of uh, integration and deployment within the concept of continuous delivery. So, and actually automatically releasing is much, much easier than giving control out of your hands. Think about that, and if you want to read more, it's Jess Humble who wrote the book in 2010 about it. Yeah, and what's the modern then about here? Specifically, it's uh, about what everyone does today. It's about, come on, probably batteries are empty. It's about immutable infrastructure, that's containers. It's about container orchestration, that's Kubernetes, OpenShift, Docker Swarm, and so on. It's about version control automation. So all things you know already, you may also use on a day-to-day -day basis. This is about uh, CI, CD pipelines. And it's about cloud-native application, uh, which are applications that are resilient and scale. So resilient means when they fall over, they stand up again by themselves. Um, so after attack, for example, or, and when there is a, a heavy load, you can scale them. You can launch multiple copies of them, and they will share the load. And there is more uh, about modern also, another aspect. Um, modern, the modern world is so complex that we need help. So there are various offering, offerings that help us with, with getting our software in a cloud. No, um, yeah, cloud services uh, like uh, on, on AWS, by Google, by Microsoft Asia. There's OpenShift, of course, so there's the, all the Kubernetes stack. And yeah, and, and not everything is a choice here. So some is a lock-in. I mean, the, the, the borders are blurred. But there is a pro there's a, that's a bit of a problem with being logged in. And we are logged in when we use a, an API, a proprietary API. So we are logged in when we use something that is only available on AWS, for example. And why is this a problem? Because it doesn't allow us to move fast. So imagine one day you find out, well, they raise their prices, and you, you don't like to pay the higher price tag. I mean, OK, they are best in town, but yeah, let's switch over to Asia or Google Cloud. They have a similar thing. How long will it take you? It's probably a project of weeks and months. But actually, it should take you, if you do it right, a couple of, well, I'm probably not saying minutes, but maybe hours. And that's it. So that should be. So um, this is, the, this is the, the today's situation. So do we have a choice? Can we change this? And I would say yes. And there is a very boring answer to this. Um, some people may know him. This is um, Uncle Bob. He's telling for years that we should do clean code. So we should do proper software development. And uh, I would add to that we should deploy from, from commit one to production. Because that's where you have your but that's why, why your time is missing in the end before you releasing to production, you know, so scary, big bang. All right, so let's jump directly in the demo. So I want to show you how this can be done. Uh, yeah. So I actually uh, showed a demo with two things. This is um, on, well, it's not showing here. This is uh, on, let me actually do the, I, I, I need to make this simpler, otherwise I can't go fast. Where is it? I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, I need to make a Red mirror. Hope that works out. OK, so I'll show a deployment on Apuyo. I mean, this is uh, just an, an OpenShift uh, um, platform that, that I run, that uh, Vision runs, the company I work for. 
And uh, this is just, just OpenShift. So yeah, what I've already prepared is I've, I have uh, yeah, kind of made this uh, free trial and uh, created two, um, two projects, uh, three project, projects actually. And I'm going to use, oh no, that was the wrong button. I'm going to use uh, a cookie cutter for generating a, a project, a Django project. So I'm going to copy this uh, code here to get started with cookie cutter. And then, yeah, here we are. So yeah, I've downloaded this already. So who is me? That's me. Then that's, yeah. Django, and this is the Euro Py oh, Python demo, and a demo for uh, the, the talk on modern continuous delivery. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not so fast. Like other people, and we're going to do that with gitlab.com. Uh, we have, a, I have prepared a namespace there, gitlab CI, I deployed to Apuya for the moment, because that's supported, and then uh, we use Django and Postgres. We run all the linting and test for Python 3.7, behave, BDD, and add some sentry thing. All right, voila, so, this has been created. If you don't see this, this is the important part. So this is what happened. Um, you're a Python demo. And yes, really, there is a repository already initialized. And hit remote minus V. And it's there as promised. So it says I can create the project here. Let's create it here. Did that work out? Well, it's probably on the wrong. Well, let's do it like this. GitLab uh, Puyo. And uh, yeah, we need to create that one. So create a new project. Oh, it's actually your Python demo. Yeah. There was the uh, demo for a talk on modern continuous delivery. So everyone knows about it, make it public so everyone can see what we're doing. Yeah, so that's it. So we know that we can, don't need, we, we don't need to look up what the instruction were because we know when we push there that should work out great. Okay, let's take a look. Yeah, that's cool, it worked out. So there's the first commit. And uh, yeah, we need to do some setup of the Apuyo uh, instance, so the OpenShift uh, cluster. So we, need, we have three, we have actually three accounts here. That's the CI process is explained here, down here. Um, and we need to run those setup procedures that are described con pre uh, concisely here. And the README, that's a service account that we have created. Uh, everyone who does Kubernetes knows or OpenShift knows what this means. And then we give them the, the uh, permissions. And, oops, sorry, wrong button. And uh, yeah, now we need the token here. And we need this token because we do the Kubernetes integration. This is nice. Um, where is it? Operations, Kubernetes. And there is no cluster configured yet. So we add a new, an existing one and we add this is the URL of Apuyo, and there is the service token. And we, this is managed by Vision, so we don't need to manage this with GitLab. 
Yeah, okay, are we done? Let's check. Well, last step. We need to provide access to of to the service of the service account to from from the other um, namespaces. So we have this. This was the the last one was for the development namespace, and now we have and before we had the integration namespace. So yeah, and that's it. Um, let's check what happened in the meantime. So. We have a pipeline running on GitLab that was configured, and uh, it looks like this. It has the checks, uh, so this is the linting, and we run tests, the one that we configured, and uh, it, then there will, the, build, the, the image will be built, so the Django application will be built uh, into an application image, and it will be deployed later. So this all goes directly with, with a single commit. Of course, we have prepared this, and you can, can do this too, or you can use something like the cookie cutter that is, that is there. Good, so let's go back to the, where is the presentation actually? Oh, probably don't need that. Yeah, so um, let's talk about what is in there. Oh, that's what I wanted to show actually. So there is this tree structure here, so I can show this what the structure actually is. So we have the application here, the application code, so this is a typical Django application, and then we have um, the deployment stuff in a single folder. So this is, these are YAML uh, files, this is Kubernetes, uh, OpenShift D Kubernetes uh, YAML files, and then we have uh, the Docker Compose for local development. Uh, we have the tests for local development, and also, of course, uh, for the pipeline. And we have for local development, we have talks, a talks configuration. So we have a few things here running. You can, you know, as usual, you can use that. What is it? Uh, let's do the safety that looks nice. Um, so the same thing we run, so actually when we run just talks, we run everything. So the same thing that runs on uh, here um, runs, well, the same thing that runs here runs identically uh, on my uh, local computer. So I'm not doing anything special, you know, and I'll show you why and why this is important. So. And of course, it behaves the same way it will behave on, on, on a pipeline. So all of the tests, the linting passed. And there was nothing built yet, but we'll see that later. So let's take a look at what that is all about. So it's actually, I um, made this, this setup in, I, I, what I used are kind of responsibility, responsibility layers. So it kind of looks like the boat here. Uh, for a reason, so there's a layer for the application logic, there is, um, uh, there is one for development, there is one that is concerned just for about deployment, so this is actual deployment to some environments, and then there's the automation, automation stuff, so the, the pipeline mainly. So in detail, what is it about? So um, what you should care about is that you, when you do it in a modern way, you just do it for one environment. Don't think in environments like this was traditionally done. Um, do think in 12-factor apps, so you read everything out from the environment logically, but don't design for different environments. Design for features. You build for features, and what does it mean? When you build for features, it looks like this, that, okay, you get a Sentry DSN, and when this is defined and not known, you, you configure this. And uh, the same thing for the debug. When debug is true, you do something that you don't do when debug is false, uh, obviously, yeah. Um, but you don't design for, 
I do debug only on in in the integration and uh, in development. You, if you want to turn it on uh, in integration, it should be possible. And uh, so you build for features, and you compose those features uh, in environments. So you compose that for the environments. Then the development uh, layer. Uh, this is actually about um, the tooling. So how you uh, how you do proper software development? How do you do professional software development? Let me go back to the application. This here should actually just work like you did software development 15 years ago. So it's just I'm doing some hacking, and I get I do pip install Django, and then I, I do uh, create um, you know Python managed by a new project, and then I just start hacking and I install everything locally. So it should work like this. So you should, this makes you independent. And then for development, you this is a separate layer. You have um, what do you have here? Yeah, you have the, the Tox configuration that helps you doing the tooling uh, with uh, yeah with all your Python stuff. So without having it to install the thing separately, you know, this helps. You only need to install Tox. Then you have, of course, you have the test because for professional software development, you you do that. You have all kinds of tests, acceptance tests, unit tests, and for easy development, you may have something like a Docker Compose which of course then goes into the deployment uh, the deployment configuration that uh, so the docker file we will see that later yeah but make it easy use standard practices so no make file or something if if there is a docker compose file every developer knows that yeah you write docker compose up docker compose build and it just works you know you do this like this yeah it's docker compose <laughs> Up. I actually may do the build. Also put this in demonized because I want to do the migrations later. Yeah, so don't write lots of instructions, comprehensive instructions. It should be simple and user friendly. You know, so when something is logic, it's log it must be logic, and not in the documentation, the wiki, or not even in the readme. The setup wasn't super logic that, uh, I mean, uh, Kubernetes is complex. Um, and then you have the deployment kind of responsibility layer, um, which is actually just con uh, concerned about everything that is um, um, about deploying to environments. And of course, your local machine or your when you develop in, in containers, it's also an environment. So that is where you, by the way, would turn on debug, for example. Uh, but you could also um, turn on Sentry, and that should be um, completely at your disposal and not, you know, kind of made by a decision made by design for environments. And so the, there is the Docker file in here, everything that uh, belongs to the Docker file, the uwiski ini, and so for for the the, the web ser uh, for the application server, and uh, or, or Gunicorn or whatever you want. The, and and this is important that this is. A separate file, so you can expect inspect it like you would inspect it as a U whiskey hero, micro whiskey hero. You would look into that. Don't put it in a YAML file. Don't mingle it into YAML files, for example. And the same for the web server. Don't mingle that nginx configuration into the YAML files. You can do that technically, but it's like PHP developers mix HTML with PHP code. Don't do that. It's difficult in Django. It's almost impossible. So don't do that in YAML. Okay, and for the secrets, of course, you should put them in, in your repository. That's the new thing. But of course, um, not in plain text. Um, because if you don't put them in the repository, you can't deploy it. You can have complicated things like a vault. But the simple thing is you seal the secrets so you, uh, you uh, encrypt them with a public key and only the the cluster has the private key to decrypt them. And you have a kind of o o Kubernetes operator there that decrypts it. All right, and then the automation, that's the simple part. Keep it simple and let the, the CI service do what you would do manually. Don't install things in the YAML, you know. Uh, let's take a look at that. Um, 
So you don't do kind of install things here. You have an image that has talks installed and that, you know, that does some things here. You say, okay, the, the test image, the, the test, actually that's just a kind of template. So the test thing has a talks image and I test for Pi 3.7. And it's not installing anything, it's all there. It also speeds up your builds. And it should also be nicely readable. So you know, this is, it's PyLint is checking here. You, you should be able to tell a story with that. This here is deploying to integration only for, for uh, changes on the master branch. So when you merge a merge request into master, for example, into the main branch. This deploys to production and only when you push a tag. So you can tell a story. And guess what? When do we deploy to the development environment? Only when we open a merge request. So this is nice to read. And that's how it should be. Tell a story and make it as simple as possible, okay? So and there are some, some, some other, uh, yeah, terms that, or uh, considerations I would like to, you to follow. So, it's the ASAP. When you hear ASAP, don't hear us, you know, don't hear the usual thing. Hear yeah. as simple as possible. I'll show you why. And deploy, deploy early, deploy, deploy often, and that means deploy from commit one and directly to production. So by the way, what do we do? Let's check what happened in the meantime. Yeah, this already, um, Deployed, so we can see here the builds. Yeah, that that's billing. That's just Docker. You know, you know that. I don't need to show this. So and uh, but by the way, uh, here the test, for example, that looks like just it looks on your console on your local machine. Yeah. And then for the deployment after building the the image, the image was pushed to to the Kubernetes cluster uh, to OpenShift actually because it has a registry. Um, and then for deployment, yeah, this looks a little bit more complicated, but these are just OC commands, a single command, so you have one image that does everything. And the good thing is here, this is nicely integrated. Let's take a look where this ended up. There we go. Click on a link, and there we go. Well, it's stuck for some reason. Yeah, this is the usual demo, God. Yeah, let's check back later. Usually this is because uh, Django needs to wait for the database, but this um, is actually waiting a little bit long. All right, so let's take a look at the process, by the way. So we said merge requests, you remember, they end up on development. Uh, when you open a, um, when you merge a merge request, so you mer you make a change on master, this ends up on integration. So I push directly on master for the fir and, uh, for the first commit. So that's that's fine then. Uh, afterwards, it should be protected. That would be good. So you can only do merge requests, and uh, then so for triggering a deployment, um, you just push a tag. So you do something like git, git tag one dot one OSA, and you say git push tags. And then the tag is pushed. And what happens is that we get a thing running the, the initial commit that will deploy it to production. The image is already built, so we don't need to build it again. So, by the way, uh, what was that? Docker, compose, um, exec, application, oh uh, yeah. Um, what is it? Python man manage. Migrate, right? So that is for Django. 
Yeah, that's cool. And then I can do dark everything that you know uh, when you know how to work with Docker Compose. Logs, I think logs minus F, right? Yeah, so it does something. That was because we had no migrations. And when, and that is actually, so when you stop this, uh, Docker Compose down, Docker Compose up. You can see this directly. Yeah. And that's easy. I can I have the link here. I can click on it. So this is just saying not found because this is this is actually there is nothing here, but this is actually a running. Um this is actually a running up uh, Django application because we have the admin. We don't have a front it front page yet. So yeah. So we can see the request here. And this is actually a nice trick that you can do this like this. And uh, yeah, and we can see this. We can see this trick in the Docker Compose file. Um, yeah. So we are not even running the web server. We are actually doing what you would do 15 years ago or 10 years ago when Django was born. You would just run. Uh, Python managed by the run server. And then you can click on this, and it's actually that this is running inside the container, but I can still access it because we have configured it correctly, like this. So, but it should be nice and easy to use. Good, then where did we stop? Yeah, okay, and then of course you commit, uh, you, you push your first commit, okay. It's not worth anything because you don't have a front page, yeah. But you iterate, you improve, you add monitoring, you 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 add more, you add actual tests because the 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 first tests are dummy tests, and so on. And then, I mean, just the usual, you know, crying of 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 us that do agile, do test driven development, do pair program, make pair programming. First, you know, do that first because you get more things done when you have two heads doing things, and when and try to to uh, tackle the test-driven thing. Try to try to write the tests first. A single line of um, code in the test that must fail. A single line of code in your code in your application that makes the test pass. Back and forth, back and forth. Only a single line. That's how how you do it. And uh, you, you have to do this. Go to, uh, attend a workshop on, on, on some PyCon and so this is super, when you, when you experience how, how good this feels, you'll never gonna write code without tests again. And for your software, so this is more for you know, general uh, consideration for projects. The less code you have to maintain internally, um, the less burden you have in the end of, okay, open source free software projects are a burden of a different kind, but you are, it, you force yourself to make it nice. You can't just leave, you know, your code base without tests because this will harm your reputation, for example. And when you have no secrets, so when you have no closed source, or you have very little closed source, you don't, you have very little uh, security holes, ideally. And hopefully, when you make this uh, popular, then uh, you you have people looking at the code for security holes. Yeah, and that is what Robert C. Martin says: the only way to go fast is to go well. And I know people don't believe this, so let's look at this. Whether he says this for real. Tell your friends in technology that the only way to go fast is to go well. Okay. If you don't believe me, believe him. <laughs> that was basically it. So if you want to try out the uh, cookie cutter, you can uh, uh, scan a QR code or click on uh, one of those logos. And uh, we are open now for, for questions, but uh, I may suggest before we start the questions, because we are all Pythonists, right? Who, who is a Pythonista? Hands up. So, and then you know the oath that we have to speak. So, speak with me. Beautiful is better than ugly. 
Explicit is better than implicit. Simple is better than complex. Complex is better than complicated, and people are leaving because they get scared. Flat is better than nested. Sparse is better than dense. And readability counts. Special cases aren't special enough to break the rules, although practicality beats purity. Errors should never pass silently unless explicitly silenced. And in the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. There should be one and only one obvious way to do it, although that way may not be obvious at first sight. Take some time. Now is better than never, although never is often better than right now. If the implementation is hard to explain, it's a bad idea. It is one. If the impl implementation is easy to explain, it may be a good idea. Continuous delivery is the, a honking great idea if you deploy it to production from commit one. Let's do it. I start today. Python. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, and especially for your live demo. Very interesting. Okay, and I think we have time for some questions. Um, you talked briefly about secrets. Uh, my question is, how do you uh, inject the private key to the container? Yes, um, that's a fair question, because I talk about secrets. and. Um, I actually expect that people say, why, um, why to commit to, uh, deploy to production? You don't do this. Anyway, maybe someone else will ask it. So um, the, the typical solution you do with uh, Kubernetes cluster is you run an operator. So you, 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 you run practically a service in the, uh, in the, um, in your cloud instance that has the, the, the secret key in there. But there are other ways. I mean, this, yeah. I'm really not a tech, uh, I'm test expert. I'm I'm not a a Kubernetes expert. I'm not a Docker expert. I'm not I'm not. I'm just telling you what you should do because Uncle Bob says it. So, but it works. I mean, we do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, people are struggling with the vaults, and and when vaults are, vaults are down, they are the single point of failure. But man, as everything, when the cluster is down, it's a single point of failure. Another question? Uh, I've seen that you deploy the merge request uh, code to a development environment. So how do yes. you handle if there are several merge requests open in parallel that all have to be reviewed? Yes, yeah, so the typical answer is GitLab review apps. Um, I've not done this here for simplicity because it really depends on how big your team is um, and, and also, you know, how much you want to spend because, you know, the, the, the concepts are nice to explain. And it's, but in the end, there are business people that say, okay, you need more RAM, you need more CPU. This costs us 50 francs more a month. No, 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 we don't, we don't do that. So the easy solution is to only have one instance. So and then it all, it's all about discipline. So if you have two, three developers, they say, OK, now I'm pushing my merge request. I'm opening merge request. And yeah, it's not the ideal way, but it, it saves money for, for the customers. And, that, and we have such customers. And for the others that want the cool solution, we do review apps. And you can find this in the GitLab CI documentation. Thank you. Other question? I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned cookie cutter, and uh, I already heard in other talks. And do you recommend you use it every day for creating the template? Well, I'm in DevOps, so I'm not creating the templates. It's for me. It's mainly, yeah, trying to help bootstrap others. I mean. What we also do, what, what, I, what I plan to do is have uh, the creation of the different uh, um, combinations automated. Um, 
but I'm, I'm not using it on a daily basis. If, for me, it's more like, you know, how do I put the, the things that, I, that we see every day and, and, you know, ideas evolve and we, we, we find out new things. For example, we have, we have uh, some kind of git pull now in the, in the build step, and this is weird, but it, but it, it uh, makes your, your build faster when, when you cache the image layers. So I need a place to put uh, that information somewhere. So I put it in the cookie cutter. And, and there are other tools. I, I, I know some, there's some Tom, some, some, something that I, that I started with, but cookie cutter is popular and yeah. It has some defects because you can't upgrade really the code you have, you have created, yeah. Thank you. Other question? Hi. Um, how do I prevent getting locked into my CD tool, in this case, GitLab? Excuse me, I couldn't hear the first part. So you've chosen to use GitLab, yes. but now you're essentially locked into GitLab because it's all very specific configurations. How do I avoid that? Yeah, so the, the, the point is, uh, you have seen I've presented those layers, and the, the GitLab is practically only the should I go back? GitLab is only this um, uh, automation layer. So it's the last layer here. So my idea is to, uh, so what, what, what we create, what I create is um, in an automation, so a, a Bitbucket pipeline configuration or a Circle CI configuration or a Travis CI configuration that fits with the deployment for example, that uh, runs all the commands that work that are designed and that are com compatible with the deployment layer. So that's the only thing I have to do. And and for for building, well, it's actually just a deployment layer, yeah, because there you build the image uh, in for building, and then you you run the OC commands or kubectl commands for for deploying. So that's how you solve it. You you generate this anew, and you you. You, you take the what what you wanted bitbucket pipelines yaml file put it in there and you um, you push that to a bitbucket repository does that answer your question yeah. thanks so much other question yeah hi um, so i'm just trying to understand so okay this is python conference but are you uh, like proposing all those things with what you said, so they should work in like language and technology agnostic way? Or is this somehow very tied to Python and Docker and so on? Why I'm asking this question is because when you talk about production, for everybody production is a different thing. Yeah? So right now, as I understand, it's just a Docker container which is deployed somewhere, right? This is the end product of this. Yeah, that's the cloud, yeah. E no, just yeah, so I computer. mean, other people have different types of production. Yeah, for example, they release I don't know RPM packages, Debian packages, which then have to be no. manually installed and so on. So, no, you don't have this. If you do, if you do Docker, if you do containers, you don't have this because you can run a, you can, you can install everything in your container. So everything is um, in your Docker file here. So. You do what you do. You, I mean, you are talking about traditional uh, deployments, correct? E yes. Yeah, yes and no. So my point is, Docker has also security concerns. So that's why yeah, well, that's not, not, not everyone problem. is. You can that's use Docker's it for problem. testing sometimes, but not for deployments. Yeah, deployments have yeah. can have different procedure. I mean, to production. Yeah, they can have completely different procedure from, yeah. for example, what you do no, in but, development. But if you if you go through the talk, through the slides again, and try to understand how, how I, may, I mean this. It's really when you work with containers, it's completely isolated. That's, that's the whole point of containers, that you don't have to worry about what does my target uh, environment look like. You don't have to worry about, you don't even have to worry about processors and all that stuff, because in the end, you, you don't even have to worry about when this happens with Kubernetes, because you only say, Hey Kubernetes, look, there is an image. You push it somewhere. Now, actually, for to Kubernetes, you only say, "Here is the configuration," and then uh, Kubernetes has a concept that is called 
um, eventual consistency. So it does not immediately deploy. It deploys when it thinks it's right. So when the time has come, so kind of, you know, so it kind of uh, fires up your container, and when that works, it, it um, shuts down the, the older one. So you don't have to worry about this, and the solution is containers, but this is not a, my talk that's, that explains that. This is just why we use containers. Okay. The, is, this, um, is, is this okay for you that I answer it this way? Can you give him the mic back, please? Yeah, we, we had to go. So in some companies, the installation procedures are much more difficult than, than this due to security concerns and due to machines being in some remote locations and so on. So and yeah, it, but it, it doesn't work as simple as this. But let's for, solve For this local now, development, yeah. it's, it's OK. You can, you can no, use the container. No, not at all. A local, local is just one environment. You know, I, I, that's I, the point. And everyone needs to understand this. This is critical. There is no local environment. There's no production. That's why I say production, because hopefully some people will jump up and say, no, we are not deploying to production. This is dangerous. It's not. You know, it's just one environment. And, you know, the point is you can give, if you have security concerns, you give the Docker containers to the people that deal with security, and they will make it secure. That's the solution. So it's not, I'm not, it's not my, about my talk. I'm taking this for granted because the, the industry now works like that. And if you and your company don't work like that, again, you should catch up. You really should. Thank you, Peter. We are the end for this session. And thank you for your time. And we can proceed with the other talk. Thank you. Thank you.